Regardless of what you might think of the idea of climate change, here is a question that's extremely difficult to answer, no matter what. What do we actually do if things start to become a little bit too hot? What scientific solutions do we have right now, and what can we possibly do to try to improve our situation on the planet? Well, naturally, there is no one answer, as a matter of fact, there is currently no good answer for any of this, but there's maybe at least one potential answer for one small problem that we might be facing in the next few decades. The amount of minimal ice cover on the planet that you can kind of visualize right here on this graph created by NASA a few years ago. Something that has been actively measured by various organizations and something that has been addressed by various scientists and something that for the most part can only mean one thing. As all of this ice melts around both Arctic and Antarctic regions, it's only going to be contributing more and more to the total level of water in the oceans, leading to some dramatic changes in the coastlines on the planet in just a few decades from now. Naturally causing some other issues as well, but this one right now is almost definitive, with overall levels increasing by approximately 8 inches in just the last 140 years. And because most of this water seems to be coming from the Arctic and the Antarctic regions, Trying to figure out how we can maybe stop the cooling effects in these regions is actually one of the potential solutions. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and so today I actually wanted to discuss this somewhat interesting paper that doesn't just propose a solution to this, but very definitively and very technically explains how it could maybe cool down the Arctic and the Antarctic regions using modern technology and using the technique that we've learned about from various volcanoes. Because we know that during various volcanic eruptions, there is usually a very specific cooling effect that follows on the planet for at least a few years. Mostly because of various aerosol emissions, such as various types of sulfuric compounds, that tend to reflect the sunlight back into space, and thus, as a result, cool down the planet, sometimes by several degrees. And though normally in the past this actually caused some major problems on the planet, such as the failure of various harvests on the planet, in theory, it's possible to control this technique and thus use it to our advantage. And that's basically what this is all about. And this even has a name. Originally proposed by the Belarusian slash Soviet climatologist Mikhail Budiko, the technique often referred to as the Budiko's blanket. Or essentially finding a controlled way to spray aerosols in the upper atmosphere, such as for example like right here, using a balloon technology that sprays these aerosols really really high in the air which then creates a very thin layer above the upper atmosphere, reflecting some of the sunlight, increasing the planetary albedo, and thus cooling down the regions underneath. And although this technology, known as stratospheric aerosol injection, is not without controversy, with at least one particular study being cancelled in Sweden just a couple of years ago, in this case, what's proposed by the scientists, at least in theory, kind of makes sense. And so I actually wanted to discuss this in a little bit more detail, because worst comes to worst, if there's really no other way for us to cool down the planet and to try to avoid the increase of the global ocean levels, this actually might be the only solution for us. And we know that it definitely will work. And in this case, this is actually one of many, many propositions of the idea known as solar geoengineering. Various scientific concepts and techniques that the scientists have been exploring and working on in order to essentially find a potential solution to the modern climate issue that does not have any solution in sight. And naturally, none of this is science fiction either. We've actually very recently discussed some of the ideas of weather modification and how it's already used in countries like, for example, China or certain regions in the Middle East, where various types of techniques, such as cloud seeding, are often used to change regional weather. For example, to induce rain, or in some cases, to try to weaken various hurricanes. Here's one of many devices used when trying to induce rain or snow above certain regions. Now you can learn more about these techniques in that video in the description, but in today's video we're actually talking about something slightly different. Something that is slightly bigger in scale, but something that is still not on global scales. In other words, the scientists are not proposing to change the climate of the entire planet or to cool down the entire Earth. This is sort of still beyond our capabilities and is also somewhat dangerous as well. For example, if you actually release something that affects the entire planet, if something goes wrong it's going to be extremely difficult to change. But focusing on more immediate problems, such as the ones in the Arctic or the Antarctica, and trying to maintain cold temperatures here, is of course a completely different question. This is something that might be worth trying. Especially because it's unlikely to affect anything else. 
In other words, the rest of the planet is still probably going to be going through warming changes and is still going to have a lot of other unusual weather events, but the polar regions of our planet, Antarctica and the Arctic, might be able to be preserved and might remain in the same way they are now. And more importantly, this technique would actually be extremely effective, it would most likely also take effect almost instantly, it would not cost a lot, and most importantly, it would be reversible. As in, if it doesn't work, just stopping it means that nothing will actually have changed. And because it's all based on the most researched method we have today, it's maybe worth trying. But I guess let's discuss this in more detail. So the first question is, of course, why the poles? Why the North Pole? Why the South Pole? Well, the main reason is because these particular regions have actually been warming up much faster than the entire planet. As a matter of fact, the warming effects here are several times larger than, for example, some of the regions in Europe or in Asia. Both the Arctic and the Antarctic regions, the record smashing heat waves in 2022. The temperatures here were actually much, much hotter than ever before, and it's very likely that it's only going to get worse next year and the year after. With all this eventually resulting in melting ice, collapsing glaciers, and pretty dramatic changes overall that are definitely going to be affecting the global ocean levels. And so the scientists behind this paper decided to explore all of these problems with a relatively practical solution. By using pre-existing airplanes, and actually a fleet of airplanes, that would fly around at certain locations on the planet every single year, dispersing certain types of elements, in order to create these localized cooling effects at very specific regions in the Arctic and the Antarctica. A program that might cost approximately $11 billion per year, something that though might sound expensive, would actually be still cheaper than dealing with a lot of damage from all of this water eventually destroying the coastlines. And so, how exactly do they propose to do this? The first choice is, of course, what airplane to use for all of this. For example, they think that some of the previously used airplanes that were generally used for refueling purposes could be converted to be used for this as well. For example, KC-135 Stratotankers would be quite efficient for this. Alternatively, they also propose creating a purpose-built airplane using some of the older parts from the airplanes that are no longer used, and a fleet of 125 such airplanes would be more than enough to do all of this every year. And in this case, the airplanes would not really have to fly to the Arctic or the Antarctica itself. They would actually only have to reach certain regions on the planet, specifically the regions right here around 60 degrees north or 60 degrees south, or essentially somewhere near Anchorage, Alaska, or the southern tip of Patagonia in Argentina. And by then flying at approximately 13,000 meters or 43,000 feet in altitude, they could then start releasing aerosols, most likely containing sulfur, for example, sulfur oxides, or maybe even sulfuric acid. And by releasing them right here, they will eventually drift all the way to the North Pole or to the South Pole because of how air circulation works on our planet. With all of this only done a few days per year, usually when the sun is at the strongest in those regions, basically during the longest day in the Antarctica and the Arctic. And so, for example, in Antarctica, it's somewhere around December 22nd, and that means that around this time you can actually use the fleet in this region, and then sometime around June 21st, the entire fleet would migrate back somewhere in North America, so basically in Alaska, and would then do this again around June 21st, with the initial calculations suggesting that it becomes possible to lower the temperatures in these particular regions by about 2 degrees Celsius, costing much much less than any other technique that could be used for similar purposes, and also being used in areas where there is practically no human populations and thus no potential dangers to anyone in these regions. Not that we expect to have any danger from this to begin with. I mean, this is after all very similar to what happens around volcanic eruptions, and so these particular emissions are quite natural. And since this is a localized program, if anything does go wrong, it can be stopped at any time, and it should not have any long-lasting effects. Although, at the moment, there is still quite uncertainty in regards to the use of these aerosols for this particular function. As a matter of fact, that's one of the reasons that particular experiment in Sweden was cancelled approximately a year and a half ago. And so it's still unclear if this is ever going to happen, but at the moment this is most likely one of the best solutions we have. And because of the risk-benefit here, this is very likely the best place to try this with the most likely immediate benefits. And obviously, if it works, there's maybe even something more effective we can use long-term to try to make this even better. For example, certain types of aluminium oxide, 
or certain other salts that were discussed in the previous video could be even more effective at cooling down those regions even faster. With just one kilogram of this stuff, pretty much cancelling out several hundred thousand kilograms of carbon dioxide. With titanium dioxide probably being one of the most effective materials known to us, although obviously also being very expensive. And I guess the main advantage coming out of this paper being the fact that all of this technology is already used or is actually somewhere in the storage. It's not being used by anyone, but it's definitely available, such as certain airplanes that could be used for the dispersal. And because sulfur aerosols are generally also very short-lived, it basically creates both the advantage and the disadvantage. The advantage being that you don't have to worry about this having a permanent effect on the planet and you can cancel this at any time. The disadvantage being that you have to do this every single year. Obviously making this a little bit more expensive. But there are obviously still some challenges and some potential problems as well. The biggest problem is the ozone layer. At the moment, it's not entirely clear if the sulfur aerosols would have any effect on the ozone layer if dispersed in these regions. And if they do have an effect on the ozone layer, they cannot be used at all. And so it's unclear which of the aerosols would be the safest to use yet. On the other hand, it's also uncertain what effects this might have on the stratospheric circulation of the air in general. If this somehow changes the circulation of the air and dramatically changes the way that air moves around the planet, it might have some dramatic effects on the weather in various regions on the planet. So none of this is currently known. Although luckily, because all of this can be cancelled at any time, at worst it would only have effects on the planet for one year. The circulation is most likely going to return back to normal once the mission stops. And obviously there are some other effects such as potential acid rain that could be created if sulfur dioxide or sulfuric acids are used. So naturally there are still some ecological problems that could be caused by all of this. But at the moment, it's still maybe the best opportunity we have to cool down the Arctic and the Antarctica. And so really the biggest problems right now are going to be political in nature. It's still going to be maybe difficult to convince the government in the United States, for example, to try to attempt this at a larger scale. And so all of this is really going to be up to the EPA or the Environmental Protection Agency that essentially has the authority over a release of aerosols, especially in regions like Alaska. And naturally, you also have to have an agreement from pretty much most of the organizations around the world and a lot of different nations because it might affect pretty much everyone. So the biggest challenge is basically going to be political. But in terms of the actual science and the feasibility of this technique, the scientists in this paper did work out most of the problems and present a relatively realistic scenario where, at least in theory, we could cool down the polar regions, preventing further deterioration in the ice levels and thus preventing the global ocean levels from rising even further. And though it's just a small solution to a much bigger problem, it still presents us with a pretty interesting opportunity to potentially prevent further increase in ocean levels, and to potentially preserve the ice levels at their current levels. But until there is actually any development in this, or until there is an actual dialogue about how this can be done and who can do this, all of this might just remain as just another paper, another proposition, another idea. Politically, it's still going to be pretty difficult to achieve. And so if there is any development in the future, I'll make sure to follow this up in another video. Until then, check out some of the previous videos on similar topics. Thank you for watching, subscribe, share this with someone who has learned about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, and maybe support this channel on Patreon by joining channel membership or by buying the one from person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.